Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning, Pastor. And a very sincere word of welcome to you this morning to our service of worship and especially on this Palm Sunday morning. This is a special service when Jesus entered into Jerusalem riding on a donkey and was received as King of Kings. And as one writer put it, that it was his coronation. And so we welcome you to this service and to all those who are tuning in from the rest of the globe. Pray God's blessing on you as you share with us. And now let's turn to the greeting. The peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. God is with us. We are not alone. And now a call to worship. The story of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem tells us that after his celebrated arrival, he went to the temple and looked around at everything. As we gather here for worship, may it be with a sense that Jesus has walked into and is looking around. May our eyes be open to see him. May our hearts be ready to be seen by him. May our worship be worthy of his presence. And may we be transformed so that we see the world through his eyes. Amen. And now, let's join together in prayer. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, on the first Palm Sunday, you entered the rebellious city where you were to die. Enter our hearts this morning, we pray, and subdue them to yourself. And as your disciples blessed your coming and spread garments and branches in your way, make us ready to lay at your feet all that we have and are, that we too may bless your coming in the name of the Lord. On this Palm Sunday, Lord Jesus, help us to see how and where you enter our world today and what you ask us to lay at your feet and how we may welcome you in. We pray your blessing on this service as we share together and we pray, O oh Lord, that our worship today may be pleasing in your sight. And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. God bless you. And you. Jesus comes to Jerusalem as king. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it, and will send it back here shortly. They went and find, found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. <clears throat> when they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over him, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. You have heard the word of God. Thanks be to God. A fellow took his dog for a walk as he did every morning and on this particular day he had a stick and he threw it into the water 
and his dog walked on the water, picked up the stick and walked back. And he was amazed. And he threw it again and again. His dog walked on the water, picked up the stick and walked back. And he thought, this is amazing. So the following morning, he invited his neighbor to come with him. So I want you to come with, I want you to come and see this. So he threw the stick in, and again the dog walked on water, picked up the stick and walked back. So he turned to his neighbor and he said to his neighbor, did you notice anything different about my dog? And Raymond said, yes, funny enough, your dog can't swim. <laughs> Sometimes we miss the obvious, don't we? And I think that when I think of the service today, I think some people miss the obvious here. In 1995, my son and myself had the wonderful, wonderful privilege uh, to watch the World Cup final at Ellis Park in Johannesburg. And we sat, sat right behind the, the, the goalposts where the winning goal was scored. And you remember it was against the Springboks versus the... Uh, uh, New Zealand, so I can tell that with pride. <laughs> and, and the last goal was scored in extra time, because in full time they were, they were drawing, the last minute of the game. Joel Skransky, Stansky put the ball right between the posts. And we were sitting about four or five meters away where that ball landed. And I want to tell you that was the most exciting moment, because at that moment we had one the World Cup. And it was a very strategic moment in the world history, in our South African history, because in 1994 Mandela was made uh, president of, the, of, of South Africa. Uh, the whole democratic thing changed in 1994 and the first real world scene was the World Cup. And it was right then, and, and he, was, he came onto the field and presented the, the, the trophy. What a moment! When we drove back home, all the streets were lined with people as in the day when Jesus entered Jerusalem. They were lined along the street and people shouting and, and, and there was just a massive joy that South Africa had gained this high tribute. Now, I don't know about you, but when one looks at what happens in crowds, one gets a bit nervous, isn't it? Now, have you been part of a crowd? I mean, can you think back in your school days, or in varsity of uni, or in uh, situations that you have been, and you were part of a, 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 a sort of a protest march or whatever? Can you remember? Can you think back? Well, you know how you are carried by emotion when you're in this group. And sometimes even a small group of 14 or 15 people, you, you kind of lose your mind yeah. in that. Have you noticed that? Our people are swayed by the moment. And crowds don't have a mind. Do you know that? When you're an individual, you think. But when you're a crowd, you don't think. And you start doing things that you normally wouldn't do if you were on your own. But suddenly in the crowd, you kind of lose this. And, and the question that I want to ask this morning is what is wrong or dangerous about mob, mob mentality? I think crowd energy is dangerous because one, most times it is non-reflective. It simply conducts and transmits energy rather than discerning and transforming it. Now think about that. An apt image for crowd energy is like an electric cord. If you look at the electric cord, it transmits the power from the source to its destination. Nothing happens to it in that. It's neither positive nor negative. It's indifferent as to whether that energy is good or destructive. It is merely a conduit. Whatever flows into it is exactly what flows out of it. Now, 
If you look at crowd mentality, that's what happens sometimes. They get in there and they just flow with everything. What, whatever's happening in that, in that crowd. Now, there's sometimes it's very good by what a crowd does. I, th I think back to June 2018. You remember when those 12 soccer players, Thai soccer players, got caught in up in the cave for two weeks? And the whole world looked on this. And I'm not mistaken, I think the Australians sent somebody over there to help them come out of that. But it, it's amazing, for two weeks the world was just concerned about this. Every morning, every news report was how these chaps were doing. And we were all so relieved when all 12 came out. That was a very good thing. It was very good. It was a, a shared energy. And it didn't matter who you were, whether you were, whether you were liberal or whether you were Labour. It didn't matter whether you were English or whether you were Australian. It didn't matter. The whole world just joined in with one cause to see this thing happen. Ethnic, religious, political lines. Now, we see, we see it here in, in Australia. When I was in Mogul, I, was, I arrived in 2009, towards the end of the year, and 2011 I had my first experience of the floods, as Mogul was completely closed. The water right down, we couldn't get out or get in, and our church became the kind of place where everybody gathered. And I want to say to you, my first, that was my first big experience of Australia. And we were most impressed that people rolled up their sleeves and they were involved all over, cleaning, doing. And I mean, the things that happened were amazing. And we were totally impressed by what we saw in Australian people. And you look at this one now, the, the, the floods right now. I mean, each day you see people being caught up in this flood. And there are those, that army of people, not only the SES, everybody, they're in there, involved, they're helping, they're caring. Marvelous when you see a crowd working together like that. We see that crowd energy when there's some good sport on, uh, like how uh, happy we were when the Reds won last night, aren't we, Kevin? <laughs> and... Uh, this, this, this kind of thing, there's, there's a, there's a, there, when, when, the, when you're into watching tennis, for example, and there's an excitement, the crowd are kind of positive in all of this. So too, on that first Palm Sunday, word got around that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. And the crowd gathered out of excitement. There were those who had heard of these miracles. They'd heard just recently that he had raised Lazarus from the dead. They had heard that blind Bartimaeus now has been given sight. They knew blind Bartimaeus, he'd been blind for a long time, it's known. They had heard that he'd fed 5,000 people with two loaves and uh, two fish and five loaves. And they'd come. There was that crowd that gathered over there. And they asked, could he be the one that we have been waiting for. Is this the one that has been prophesied in the past? He has come to deliver us from, from bondage. They were in the crowd. However, there were others that day. Some who wanted something from Jesus. They had heard he'd been healing. They came too and said, maybe he's going to touch me and heal me today. So there was a whole group that had come, hoping that they today could go away being healed. The poor But there were others there too that day that were angry, angry at him. He had come to destroy their traditions, the Jewish council, and they were in that crowd. And they weren't too happy to see him. Also, they're angry. There were also those who were curious. They saw this all happening and they didn't know what was going on and they just joined in the crowd, as people do. I've seen that uh, in the kind of marches. That people just suddenly see it all happen. They come and join us. So what are we doing here? What are we protesting for? You know, that sort of thing. And that day, Jesus appeared. Riding a donkey. And the crowd shouted, Hosanna to the King of Kings, waving palm branches and laying their garments down. As one author had put it, it was the coronation day of Jesus. He was crowned king. Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. 
Hosanna in the high, <coughs> highest heaven. Amen. Now I want to go on to say that there is a contradiction in crowds. Crowd energy can be positive or it can be negative, as I said. When a group of people have assembled because of their, their because they're emotional and angry about something, and so they go on there to, to, to protest this, to make their, their voices heard. Others will follow the initial rioters lead and begin destroying property or hurting people. We've seen that, a lot of that. And of course, a lot of research has been conducted into the mindset of a violent mob. Being part of a group can destroy people's inhibitions, making them do things they never otherwise do. They lose their individual values and principles and adopt the group's principles, which during a riot usually to cause destruction and to avoid detection. In other words, they get involved and they say, they're not going to know that I've done this or I've been part of it because I'm in the crowd. No one's going to know that I was part of this thing. So being in the midst of a crowd can be exciting and powerful and makes people feel invisible so they can do what they want to. They are part of a huge group so they won't be detected and held responsible for their actions. And friends, we have seen this. We have seen this. If you look at America, because it's been on the news so much in this last while now, with old Floyd. Remember when, when he was going through that terrible death? Look at the destruction that followed. We don't have to go very far. Look at this last storming of the, um, of the White House. You know, as I was thinking about this, and saying, you know, there's something of that in the, in the whole thing of Jesus coming into, coming into Jerusalem that day. There's something of that. There was that energy behind his crucifixion. Think with me for a moment. If we look at the crowd before the crucifixion, that's on, he enters in Palm Sunday, and that crowd swept by the emotion of that moment, and he's the King of Kings, and he's the Lord of Lords, and they're singing praises and what have you. Friends, five days later, five days later, that same crowd are there at Pilate's Hall, and Pilate speaks to them, as they gathered outside and he says then what do you wish me to do with a man they call the king of the Jews because they said they said hey, he knows that they were crowning him that day what did they shout back crucify him crucify him and their shouts were louder than the apostles and those who had been healed and those who crucify him and that's the feeling Crowds are fickle because crowds don't think. And I'm sure many when they sit back and think of what they've did, how they must have felt after that. From day to day, they, they are at opposite opinions. One day they for him, the next day they against him. And friends, that happens all the time. It happens in our personal lives. Yes, Judas, what more sacred moment could there be that Judas sits with him at the Last Supper, goes out, and that same night betrays him to the enemies. That same night. What about Peter? At the same place, says, man, I will go to you to death. I will do anything you want. So committed. That same night. He betrays him. He denies that he knows him. Now friends, are we not all guilty of that? Are we not all guilty of that? On Sundays we, we sing God's praises. And on Monday, we're different. We deny, we betray by our lifestyle, our attitudes, our language. We identify with his cause today, but we ignore it tomorrow. <clears throat> In one of my churches, there was a 16-year-old boy who came up to me, and he said to me, we were honoring 
the leaders of the church and after the service he pulled me one side and he said you know you know my father the leader but you don't know my father at home and how he abuses us how he abuses my mother he's not the same man in one way or another is this not an area we all struggle with we believe and then we doubt and so James tries to sum this up he says and every decision you then make will be uncertain as you turn first this way and then that a contradiction a paradise neither a paradox neither hot nor cold but here's the challenge that I want to leave with us this morning there is another side to this so often our belief is that we are just a group of people that are here today that we're in the crowd and that God doesn't love us individually and some of us find that in the crowd we can hide we forget that every individual person sitting in this church and listening here today God loves you no matter where you are God created you and he created me and he created us for a purpose and he loves us deeply Amen. In the Gospels, the letters, the New Testament, it's so obvious God loves us, but yet it won't sink in. Karl Barth, one of the great theologians of the 20th century, he was taking a, having, addressing a crowd uh, of students in a, at, at a uni, and at the end he asked for questions, and once one fellow got up and he said, uh, Mr. Barth, he said, you are well read theologically and you know the Bible. What is the one truth that you have learnt in your studies of the Bible? And Karl Barth, without flitching, turned and said, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. This great man, Jesus loves me. Even though we have heard this message again and again and again, we still remain so neutral in that understanding and belief. I'm too old, I'm too bad, I've done too many bad things. And so we've sat in the grandstand watching others do the work and watched others carry the colors of Christ. And perhaps we've stayed in the crowd because we've been disillusioned with Christians. There are people today who don't want to get back into church and don't want to be part of it because they're disillusioned with Christians. Some are disillusioned with the church. They see what the, 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 the papers say. They watch the nonsense on TV and they believe that that's what the church is like. My friends, let me tell you, no one is perfect. No one is perfect. There is no perfect organization. But still we support it. When you watch these rugby matches, if somebody in the, in the scrum, the rugby, and one chap punches another guy, we don't say, I'm not going to watch rugby anymore because what, did you see that guy punch somebody in the, in the... No. When we read about the bribing that takes place in cricket, do we stop watching cricket? No. We don't stop watching it. Our eyes must recognize that we need to, it must rise above to the one riding on the donkey. It's so safe in the crowd. So many excuses. We don't have to get involved in the kingdom of God. In the grandstand, it's comfortable and it's non-threatening. Today, if we're looking for a comfortable life, a superficial life with no hardships, no real depth, no real growth, then stay in the crowd. It's safe there. We move in and move out. Nobody knows. And we just have that kind of superficial life. But I want to say to you that... It's easy sitting in the crowd passing comments, negative comments. It's easy to criticize. Ref, shake your head. Your eyes are stuck. Or ref, you, you got the wrong color jersey on. All these sort of things I used to hear when you played soccer. But if we're looking for something with meat in it, something worthwhile to give our life to, something that will bring life with positive results, then I wanted to ask you this morning to step out of the crowd. That's what I want to ask you to do this morning. To step out of the crowd and be counted. 
I once heard a story when I was a young Christian. I was a, I think I had been converted for about a year, and I've never forgotten that story. It just always seems to speak to me in situations. There's a fellow by the name of Don Loney. He had gone to a meeting, and standing on the stage was a man giving a, a, a lecture to over a thousand people in that audience. And he was using the Lord's name in a very derogatory way. And people were feeling very uncomfortable. And so what he did is he got up onto his chair and he said, Mr. Speaker, leave Christ out of this. And he sat down. And they say that there were more people there to shake the hand of the guys who was prepared to stand up to shake his hand than there were to shake the hand of the speaker. He had the courage to get up and speak in that situation. Step out and do something positive about any evil or abuse you come across. Start where you are. Use the influence of our vote. It's important that. Write, speak up when opportunity arises. Sure, it's difficult, but we can all do something. Don't forget this. Evil thrives where good people do nothing. <coughs> evil thrives where good people do nothing. Step out. And do something about those in need. When you come across a need, hurting people, hurting because of life's demands, hurting because of their situation, ask what would Jesus do in this guy's situation? It's come across me. It's like the, the old story of the Good Samaritan. He came across that need and he stopped and he did sorted that need out. You don't have to go looking for needs. No, say where can, they are on your doorstep and my doorstep. When you come across it, stop and say, what can I do here, Lord? Step out and get involved in some service in the church or community. Do something positive about growing as a church, as a Christ follower. Make the time and sacrifice. Step out and deal with our hurtful relationships at home. Get our own house in order. Don't ignore the issues there. Step out and do something about non-Christians. We all say, and now we all here, we say, we want to grow this church. We want to get more young couples in here. Want, how are they going to get here if we don't step out and invite somebody? Speak to somebody and say, how about coming to church with me? We've got to do something. It's not going to grow by itself. Nobody's going to ride past you and say, let me duck in here and see what these guys are up to. I see a lot of cars here in the morning. No, we've got to invite somebody. I came to church because somebody invited me there. We can all do something, no matter how small, for one of God's people in need. And we're all God's people. Remember what Matthew 25 says. In so much as you have done it to one of the least of these, you have done it to me. The challenge for us is to step out this morning and be identified with the crowd. Now let me close, that there is today a very important message for all of us. And that message for us today is that there is a call on our lives to do something. There is a call of God for each of us. When God created you in the beginning, He had a place and a purpose for you. He's not going to call you to step out in something that you haven't got the capabilities nor the gifts. He's going to call you in a place that you know that this is where God wants to use me. Amen. And if you open to the Lord, if you open to Him, you will hear that voice. You will hear the voice, this is the way, walk ye in it. This is the way. And so in closing, let me say, the challenge for us today is to step out. I can't say anything more. It is to step out. I need to say, Lord, I'm right behind you. I'm in that crowd. He's passing by. I'm going to step out today. I'm no longer going to be quiet and sitting in the audience. I'm going to step out today, and I want to be counted for you. Help me to discover the place where you can use me and use me for the kingdom. May God bless us as we step out for him. Let's bow our heads. To know God... Our sins forgiven and life now and eternity. 
is such a wonderful knowledge and one that people today are searching for. I want to ask you two questions to consider. Think of one area where you can step out and make a difference. One area. Ask God to empower us to fulfill that challenge. And the second thing I want to ask you is think of one person that you are specifically going to pray for this week. That God would draw that person nearer to himself. Maybe a prayer like this, you may want to pray a personal prayer, which I'm praying today. Master, I am just behind you. I have broken free from the crowd. I am not really passive now. I really want to follow you. I want to be part of your work in changing this world. I know I've been looking on while you and others have done all the work. Lord, let me take my share now, whatever it means. And I'll try not to let you down when I feel the nails. Lord, hear are our individual prayers as we make them to you today. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Good morning. Good morning. Peace be with you. And also with you. Kindness. Kindness goes hand in hand with mercy. When we are being kind, we are being merciful. We do this in our prayers of the people by showing our deep and genuine concern for others. Kindness and mercy are uppermost in our thoughts and prayers as we come to our Lord's table. I ask you to please speak the names of those you would like us to pray for. Kevin? Paul. Paul. Thank you. I would like to add to our prayers a very dear friend of ours named Ronan. Also Geraldine's niece Adele. And at this stage we would like to give thanks to Geraldine's stroke specialist for his continuing care and attention. Thank you. Let us pray to our loving God. Father God, we come together in your house to hear your word, praise your name and stand in awe of you. We pray for the Holy Spirit to be upon us and to carry with us the wisdom, power and strength your message brings to us. We are a loving and caring church, Lord. Our church family reaches out with our prayers, help and support for those whose names we have spoken and for all those who seek and need you. We pray, Lord, that you minister to their spirit where there is pain and suffering Bless them with peace and mercy. Show them a new revelation of your love and power. Release to them a renewed confidence through your grace. We pray for our church, our community and for world peace. We pray for the welfare and well-being of the people caught up in the devastating floods on the east coast of our nation. And we pray for the brave rescue people 
for their safety as they go out to help them. And we also hold in our prayers our frontline medical teams as they continue to fight against the COVID pandemic. Father God, we call upon you as we pray for the victims and families of domestic violence and child abuse. We ask for your help and guidance, Lord, so we can reach out and give the victims and families the confidence, love and trust they so need so they can go forward with their lives. We pray for their future will be one where they can feel safe and secure and know God's peace, love and mercy is upon them. Father God, we pray for your help to enlarge our circle of love so we can bond with other believers and truly witness the fellowship, trust and love you have created through the unity of faith. Amen. Please join me as we say together our Lord's Prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, yours will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, our sins against us, and save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And now, blessing, as we, as we close, I'm going to ask you to stand for that. We uh, give thanks, first of all, for the offering and uh, and then a blessing as we go out for mission Lord bless our gifts and grant that the offerings we have made be a sign of our greater giving the offering of our time and our talents our loyalty and our love indeed the offering of our whole life for the service of Jesus Christ our Lord and now a blessing. Go into all the world, said Jesus, we go to make a loving words heard. What you do for the least, you do for me, said Jesus. I will never drive away any who come to me, said Jesus. May the love of God fill our hearts and make us one with God and with all of God's children. And may you all... Amen. And then the grace. <coughs> may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen.